Thanks for joining us. Um, today, our first guest uh, is Eileen Yushitel. She works at Git GitHub. So, welcome. Thank you. Um, so, Eileen, you are a senior system architect or engineer at GitHub, and you're very passionate also for security. Um, but we think before we get into this, uh, can you tell us a little bit about like how you started programming? So when when did you start? Oh, that's a really long and sort of funny story. So in college, I was a program uh, a photography major, not a programming major, <laughs> um, and we ooh, I dropped that. No words. <laughs> um, and we had a graph, graphic design class that taught Flash that I took. And so that was my first programming, was, was learning how to program Flash animations. And I really enjoyed it. So then I took another class, some HTML and CSS, and learned a little bit more. And then I asked my professor, like, hey, how can I learn even more programming? And he goes to me, why would you want to do that? Then you're a programmer, not a designer. And I said to him, programmers make more money. Uh, and like my thinking was that if I could do everything from photography to design to programming to deployment, that like then I could do whatever I wanted. If I stopped liking design, I could do more back end. If I stopped liking back end, I could still do front end. It didn't matter like you have access to everything and know how to do everything. You have more choices in the jobs that you take. Um, so then after that, I mostly taught myself everything until about 2012. I went to Big Nerd Ranch, which is like this school in Atlanta that, in, this is before boot camps were cool and popular. So they just had these one week intensives that was two days of Ruby and five days of Rails. And that's how I learned Rails and Ruby and and I just kept teaching myself more, and that's the short version of the story. Okay, so you mentioned uh, Ruby, you mentioned Rails, so um, what do you like about Rails compared to other frameworks? So why Rails? I very quickly fell in love with Rails because of how easy it was to just make something. Uh, it didn't take a long time to to have an app running and have models and controllers and like actually make something work. Um, Rails and Ruby both really care a lot about developer happiness and other frameworks just don't have that as part of their mission. And so everything that goes into Rails is to make your programming easier and more fun. And that's what I love about it. Mm -hmm. So, um the creator of Rails, uh, David Heinemar Hansen, uh, you also worked with him because you worked at Basecamp for some time, uh, and also Jason Fried. And um, uh, what I would like to know is, like, I mean, Basecamp is really a, an outstanding company. I would say um, they have a very interesting blog, uh, Signal versus Noise, um, for I think 15 years now. They have written. Books like uh, a rework, getting things done, um, very opinionated sometimes. Uh, so, how is it to work at the company like Basecamp? How was it for you? Um, well, it was it was really great just being able to work with like the creator of something. You don't necessarily get that experience, and it was really interesting to see the way he thought about problems and solved 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 problems in our application and solved problems in Rails and um, yeah. Mm, okay. <laughs> Does that answer it's, your question? It, of course. <laughs> um, so if you talk a little bit more about security, because you're very passionate about security, um, security always feels a little bit like an uphill battle because it's always like uh, you don't yet know the vulnerability. You just know it when it happened. And then um, it feels like you always just react on something. So can you tell us a little bit more about like how can you like mitigate risk or what is the approach in, in, in uh, here? Well, I think the first thing for dealing with security is use a framework that puts security first. 
Rails does a lot of work to make sure that you don't do bad things in your app. And we can't prevent you from doing all the bad things, but starting with something where you don't have to know how everything works is a good first step. Um, keeping your apps up to date, uh, waiting, waiting until Rails 3.2 is so end of life that no one is willing to write a patch for any security release anymore, makes it just really, really hard to stay up to date with what's the right way to do things? What's the right way to write, write code? Am I, am I secure? Oh, now I have to write my own patch. And then that, that by itself is a really good way to introduce even more vulnerabilities. Uh, security is really hard because like sometimes you fix something and you find out that you actually made a worse security vulnerability with how you fixed it. And then, then everything is even more terrible. Um, the other thing is educated, like education, just making sure that everyone who is onboarded to your team thinks of security as a feature. It's not an afterthought. It's not something that happens when you get hacked. It's not something that happens when Hacker One sends a report. It's something that happens from day one. Like if you build everything you build, if you build it with the mindset that security comes first, then inherently it should be more secure because you're paying attention. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, security first. Um How does it work like in a team? Because I think not everybody is like um, has a formal security education. Uh, so how can you involve everyone in this kind of process? Uh, I think a few ways are training. Uh, another way is to, for things that are easy to catch, uh, SQL injection, not adding this, uh, accidentally skipping the CSRF protection, Uh, add it using JavaScript to render HTML instead of going through. Uh, I'm going to use Rails as an example because I don't know other frameworks that do whether other frameworks do, do this, but Rails renderer will not like allow injection of of JavaScript tags into your HTML. Whereas JavaScript just like is like plop there, have it, and then suddenly you have a XSS vulnerability. Uh, so. Linters can really help with that. We have our bots. We have a lot of bots on Git on our GitHub code base that actually read the code that you add, and notifies the security team if they think there's a SQL injection or CSRF isn't added or you're uh, putting HTML, uh, putting user. Sorry, it's not HTML. That's the problem. It's the user generated content that being put into HTML. So if a user sets their username to script. Uh, I have been, you have been owned, <laughs> end script tag, and then you like just dump it into your HTML and render it. If you're not using Rails or something else to protect that HTML, you're going to have JavaScript run, and that could potentially be extremely terrible. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, how many people like at GitHub, your team, how is your team structured? Uh, uh, my particular team or the security team? Because I'm not on the security team at GitHub. Then your security team, okay. if, you, if you can uh, talk about it. Our security team is really big. We, uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting about GitHub's security team is we combine, that the part of the org that does security combines physical security, employee security, uh, computer security, and app security, and sy system security. Mm -hmm. So they're all one entity, and so they all have to think about like what what are the, the holes uh, in, in our in our buildings, in our laptops, in our employees, and in our app code. Mm -hmm. And so th I think that by having this one entity that is cares about security, it does help have this like sort of all-encompassing effect where security is taken very seriously versus if like the AppSec team is just sort of like wherever, like in a different part of the org. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it has this, uh, it has more weight If you have like this is my whole security team, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we care about security on every level and every front. Wow. Okay. And now let's talk a little bit more about your team. Team you're working on. Uh, yeah. So right now uh, our team is pretty small. It's it's me and Aaron Patterson. If you all know Tenderlove, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. he's very popular in the Rails community. Yeah. Uh, so him and I work a lot on upgrading Rails and Ruby. We work on open source libraries like Rails, Ruby, and Rack. Uh, we help set like some of the standards for that. And another part of our team is helping other people inside and outside GitHub get involved in open source and contribute back upstream rather than 
like monkey punching the app. <laughs> okay. Um, another topic I would like to discuss is um, there's a lot of conversation about uh, diversity inclusion uh, in the general in the tech industry, and I would like to know from you. Uh, If you could change or address one thing regarding this topic, uh, what would it be? Oh, this is one of those questions of those. that <laughs> potentially get weird. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of areas in which we, we have problems with diversity, and a lot of people focus on the pipeline. And I think part of the reason is because that feels easier. Because when you focus on the pipeline, you don't have to take blame for what's happening in the industry. You go, well, it's just just the pipeline, like I can help fix that. But really what the, the biggest difference you can make is supporting people that are underrepresented in your company. Make sure they have a voice. Make sure that they're not getting passed over for promotions. Like people who are underrepresented are already doing enough work and the people who have privilege and power should be helping them succeed and not, not when they see bias happening or they see, uh, disrespect happening like making sure that they that you step up and don't allow that to continue thank you very much okay so thank you very much um, now are there any questions from the audience please raise your hands oh I'd like to clarify there absolutely is a pipeline problem it's just not the only problem <laughs> okay we can also elaborate yeah. on this a bit more <laughs> if you want yeah. so any questions Hi. Um, I just want to know personally, because we are all using GitHub, I think, on almost a daily basis. And I just want to know, what is it like to work in GitHub? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a little like, meta, like, you're, like, working on GitHub, inside GitHub, to use GitHub. Uh, sometimes we, we overuse GitHub, like, in ways that it's not supposed to be. Like, when I first started my team, would use issues for out of office notifications. And I was like, okay, calendars exist for a reason. And we should really use a calendar for this because you couldn't find like who was out of the office because you'd have to like sift through the issues of like, okay, where are the out of office issues? When did this person create the issue? Are they out of office? And so we stopped doing that because it was a terrible idea. Um, uh, but this isn't the first place that I've used the tool that I'm using to build the tool that I'm using. Like, mm -hmm. at Basecamp, we used Basecamp to build Basecamp. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of, like, funny to be in those situations where you're like, oh, I'm the user of my product, and I think that... Uh, I've worked on, at other companies where I wasn't the user of the product, and it was a totally different experience. Like, you could break something and not know about it. Whereas if you're using GitHub every day to build GitHub, you know a lot more of the areas where you might break it or uh, it, much different from if you're building an app that you don't actually use for day-to-day -day work. Like, of course, you're using it to test it, but there's a lot of apps that you don't use to build your app. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting kind of experience. Thank you. So any other questions? Eileen, thanks for the talk. Yeah. Uh, How it is about? I checked your Twitter account and you posted regarding the future of Rails 6. So, uh -huh. but currently GitHub is on 4.2. Yeah. Yeah. How it is like? Because I am coming from Swift community and uh, yeah, I know how it is to uh, rewrite code base to be on uh, uh, on the same step as Swift evolves. So, how it is like uh, you? Uh, support current version or you upgrade to newer how it is working in github uh so we we dual boot we have the app is dual bootable in two different rails versions so we'll have the production version which right now is 4.2 and then the version we're trying to upgrade to so which is 5.0 and we'll have a separate build that runs all the same tests that 4.2 runs and we work to get those green and as soon as they're green we mark the build as required. 
so that no one can introduce regressions after that for 5.0 while we work on the next build, and then that's green and required in the next build, and then we do like deploy rounds. Uh, for 4.0.2, I think I did like maybe 15 or 20 deploys before to just test before we actually went fully to production. Um, for like the, I'm hoping that by the end of this year we're on edge rails and so that we can really push rails forward in the way that I want to. Uh, we have a lot of stuff in our app that belongs in rails, not in our app. And so I'm working on extracting some of that stuff. So once we're on Rails 6, we're not still like behind. But uh, Rails 6 is going to take a while, so I'm hoping, fingers crossed, by the time that we get to, by the time we're releasing Rails 6, that GitHub is already on Rails 6. And so we'll be even uh, more confident that Rails 6 is stable. Uh, Rails has been like, very, very stable in the last few years because Basecamp stays on Edge and Shopify does not run production on Edge, but they run a build against Edge. So we know really early if there are bugs. And so I'm hoping that we can get GitHub to the point where we're also pushing the, the edges of Rails and finding bugs early rather than like six years later. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Over there. Hi. Um, so you, you work with Aaron, obviously. But yeah. do you have any tips on how to get a good mentor, like someone to really help you grow and then like maybe enable you to dive into things that you probably wouldn't on your own? Um, I think one of the, the things that you need to, to do to find a good mentor is to come to them with a specific problem. Uh, if you find someone that you respect and trust and you want to learn more from them, going to them and saying, I want to learn something isn't helpful for them. Uh, people have a lot of, like they don't have necessarily have a lot of free time. So the the way like Aaron and I ended up working together was I had a specific problem in Rails. And then I had another specific problem and another specific problem. So it was easy for us to keep working together because we didn't have to like invent something to work on. And so um, it's really it's really important in like any mentorship partnership, uh, whether you do, so we have one at work where we get paired with an outside person um, who who maybe has something, has a skill that you want to learn. So like, say you want to get better at bringing your ideas up the executive chain of a company, you would work with your mentor because they would have already done something like that. And we have that specific goal. So we can be like, okay, uh, this is how you write proposals. This is how you get stuff in front of executives. So it's that kind of stuff where you have to like come to them with a specific problem and you're going to have a way better experience with a mentor. I've had like other partnerships where I was I was the mentor, we didn't have anything specific to work on, and so it just sort of like fell apart a lot faster than if you have like set weekly meetings or every other week and then something very specific, not very specific, but a particular thing that you want to work on and that really helps your mentor guide you. Okay, thanks. Do we have time for one more? Okay. So, any more questions? Okay, I think that. Oh, please. Hello, thank you for the talk. The question might be a little bit stupid, but what's your favorite and what's your least favorite Git command? My uh, favorite, least favorite what? Git command. Git like, command? Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so my my favorite is probably git bisect, but git reflog is like a really close second. And my least favorite... Oh, my least favorite is the fact that you can... This is not really a command, though. It's the fact that you can commit like everything without being required to do patch commits. And I feel like the default should be patch commits. And uh, like it should, it should literally not let you push if your commit message is one line. <laughs> Super. OK, so thank you very much for joining us. It was a pleasure to have you. So a big round of applause for Eileen. Thank you.